No one knew, but Jesus knew. No one was prepared and knew that this was his last hour. No one knew that he was feeling overwhelmed. No one knew he was tempted to dread. No one, none of the disciples knew, but Jesus knew. And it's amazing that in moments like this, where Jesus was struggling, where the enemy was coming against his mind to tempt him, that God could send someone with an extravagant bit of worship to comfort his spirit. None of the disciples knew. And we may never fully understand the significance to God of when someone lays out everything before the Lord and worships Him with all of their heart, with all of their mind. Maybe God wants someone to dance or to wave a flag. We might not know why. Some people walk into church and they get freaked out by it. Maybe even embarrassed by it. But God sees the value in these things when we don't. And it's God that these things are for, not us. Two days before the Passover, we'll go back in a few lessons ago. Two days before the Passover, Jesus was staying in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, likely the father of Judas Iscariot. Matthew chapter 26, John 12. He was spending time with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, who were cooking in the kitchen at that house. Dinner was going well, and everyone was enjoying one another's company. Mary, however, at one point in the evening, disappeared from the room. Suddenly, she emerged, and in her hands is an alabaster flask. She breaks it open, and then the smell of the perfume filled the entire room. And then, in front of the whole house, she pours it over the head of Jesus, who has sat there at the table and watched her slowly approach him. Remaining, all the oil remaining, she poured on his feet, anointing them, and began to wipe his feet with her unbound hair. And the entire room stood in shock, not knowing what to do or what to say. A woman's hair is her treasure, as any of these Jewish men would have known. And there Mary, according to their thinking, cheapened herself. But they did not realize that the feet of the man she was anointing made her hair far more precious in the sight of God. The scent of the room was overwhelming. But Judas, perhaps embarrassed by the vulnerability of the moment, confused by the awkwardness in the room, not understanding the value of worship or what God cares about, perhaps jealous of the attention, speaks up. Why is this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And Jesus snaps back, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but you don't always have me. John 12. And he also said, assuredly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, this woman, what she's done, will be a memorial to her. Matthew 26. Scripture tells us that Judas really wanted that money, as was said earlier in a few lessons ago, because he took from the ministry pension. <laughs> he took from their finances and he would spend it greedily on his own things. I doubt that Judas came into the ministry wanting to betray anybody or to even steal. Now, we know that Jesus knew he was a devil from the beginning. But Satan doesn't always give us these strong, betraying motivations up front. Most people that end up betraying one another in the ministry don't start out that way. But seeds over time with unchecked motivations grow. Judas likely had become entitled over time. Likely had become deluded over time. He likely allowed himself to think that Jesus did not know what he was doing with the, with the ministry treasury. He likely didn't realize that just because Jesus had entrusted him with something didn't mean he was trustworthy. So, I do believe that he had incorrect motivations from the beginning. But, 
like many of the other disciples, he likely came in with a lot of sincerity. But Judas, just like the rest of them, was motivated by glory. He was motivated by opportunity for fame, for riches, exaltation. And he wasn't ready to die. He wasn't ready for hardship. He wasn't ready for the even personal correction from Jesus, the Messiah, in front of his father and this household. And after this, he wasn't ready for the comparison between him and this woman. He was entitled. He wanted power and position in the ministry. He wanted attention. And he believed it was his right. He likely, he likely believed it was his right to steal from the ministry. Over time, he would begin to justify to himself, I mean, everything I do for this ministry... I mean, come on, I, I need a new tunic. I, need, I have to go make purchases for myself. i got to treat myself a little bit here. I'm working hard for the Messiah. This rebuke from Jesus exposed that Judas wanted Jesus' empowerment, but not Jesus' correction. He wanted riches and not a rebuke. He wanted all of the easy, none of the hard. He was angry that Jesus wasn't promising to overthrow the, the Romans. And he was frustrated at Mary's worship because he felt locked out of Jesus' inner circle. But he fell into the same trap that Cain did with Abel. He despised another person's worship instead of realizing that his bad attitude was keeping him from really drawing near to Jesus. Embarrassed by Jesus calling him out, wanting to put pressure on Jesus to prove himself to the Sanhedrin, and trying to protect himself from the Sanhedrin's wrath, Judas decided what he was going to do. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? What are you willing to give me if I give him over to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time forward, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Matthew 26, 14 through 16. It wasn't just about the money. Judas needed to make sure he was secure no matter what happened. He needed insurance. He thought that he could win with both Jesus and the world. He hoped that he could fight to save his own life and still have Jesus. But you can't. We will resume this teaching after a short message from International School of the Word. This teaching is one lesson taken from a full course on isow.org. If you are enjoying this video, we invite you to check out the full course in the links below. For the best value, try our All Access Pass. At just $99 per month, you can access thousands of hours worth of high quality, world-class teaching. To check local pricing in your country, visit isow.org. For more great teachings like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Now, back to this teaching from International School of the Word. The Passover dinner. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when Passover meaning the Passover lamb, must be sacrificed. And he, Jesus, sent Peter and John saying, Go, prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat. Luke 22, 7 through 8. Now, there are some details that we know actually about the way that Passovers were carried out at that time and how Jesus and his disciples would have actually done it that evening. It is not completely dissimilar from how Passovers are carried out in Jewish families today in their homes. The lamb that evening had already been selected the day before for the Passover meal, and it was being actually prepared that very evening, sacrificed. And it was a remembrance for the Jewish people of a freedom from the Egyptian bondage that God had taken them out of. The evening before that evening where Jesus was going in with his disciples, all the little children in the house there in Jerusalem would have searched it top to bottom like a game to find all the leavened bread and get it out of the house, symbolizing that there was no sin in their midst. As all the disciples came filing into this home that was prepared for Jesus at his command in Matthew 26, 18, they would each one by one step through the door 
and according to how it usually went, they would have had their feet washed by a servant with a basin and a towel at the ready, right by the entrance. They were all seated. They washed their hands. They were ready to eat. They all laid down on pillows on the ground, and they sat at a table about 18 inches high, relaxing. The tradition of the meal had many similarities with how the Jewish people do it now, and they would pour four cups of wine throughout the dinner, two were before they really began to chow down and eat the food, and then two came afterwards while they were eating and finishing the meal, and then at the end of the evening, they would sing from the Psalms. Each of them couldn't have fully realized what was about to happen. There was a liturgy that is always read from in Exodus 6 by the head of the household in the Jewish family. Jesus, taking the first cup of the Passover meal, looking at each of them in the eye, would have quoted these words, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Then he lifted up the second cup of the Passover cedar, and he would say to them, I will deliver you from their bondage. Then they all began to wash their hands in preparation to eat the unleavened bread. But perhaps it was at this moment in the supper that something strange and unexpected happened. Jesus got up from laying down. He changed his clothes and he girded up a towel around his waist. And then... He did something. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. He went down the line, each of them, washing their feet one by one. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus said, what I'm doing, you don't understand now but you will know after this. And Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. If I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only. Wash my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, Peter, but is completely, he is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean otherwise. And you're clean, but not all of you. Jesus knew one of them wasn't clean. But he still washed every single one of their feet. John 13. As they were all shocked, Jesus finishes the last person's feet, redressing again as he was before. And he comes back to look at them. And then he says, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you say, You say that well, it's true. For so I am. If I then, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus laid back down at the table, and then he continued the Passover meal. And since the second cup was already blessed, they began to dig in and to eat the meal of Passover, dipping their bread and drinking from their cups. After they were all talking, laughing, and they were done with most of their feasting with each other, Jesus then picks up one of the last pieces of bread, these big old pieces of matzah, unleavened bread. He lifts it up, and he doesn't say the traditional prayer right away. But instead, he looks at his disciples with the weighty eyes full of love. And he says, take, eat, this is my body. And they all took the bread and they broke it out of obedience, but they didn't know what he was talking about. What is this new thing he's saying? We've never done this at Passover before. Then he took up the third cup of the meal, which is referred to as the cup of redemption. Along with another quote from Exodus, he said, 
I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. He also says then, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Around this time, as they all began to wonder as to what the meaning of this new addition to Passover was, Jesus' face began to change. A moment ago, He was joyful, and He was talking with them, and they were all relaxed and laughing and having a good time. But then, a sadness started to wash over Him. And He looked up, and He said to everyone for them to hear, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then each of them were deeply concerned. They started to ask one another. And they asked him, Is it I? Is it I, Lord? You're not talking about me, are you? I, I, can't, I would never betray you. You're not talking about me. Then Jesus said, It's one of the twelve who dips in the dish with me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. As each continued to ask him around and around, Master, Rabbi, is it I? Is it I? Judas musters up the strength and looks to him so nothing is suspected of him among the twelve. And he asks, Rabbi, is it I? Jesus looks him in the eye and says, You have said it quietly enough so that no one else hears. Thank you so much for supporting our ministry. If this has blessed you, please say a prayer for us. And if you would like to give, we have three ways that you can do that. You can give online at iso.org forward slash donate or text the word give and the amount to 423-225-9022. That's 423-225-9022. You can also give through the mail at ISOW, 340 Paul Huff Parkway, Northwest, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37312. Thank you. God bless you and may the Lord multiply your seed. Now back to this teaching from the International School of the Word. And Peter then leans over because John was sitting by Jesus the whole time reclining next to him. He leans over to John. He says, John, come here. Ask who the betrayer is. Ask the master who the betrayer is. John leans over. Lord, who is it? It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I've dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do? Do it quickly. Judas rose from the table and left quickly, just as Jesus had said. And many of the disciples all thought he was just going out to buy something else for the Passover meal in John 13. As the meal was closing, Jesus didn't partake of the fourth and final cup of Passover. He said he wouldn't drink of the cup again until he returned his father's kingdom. But perhaps he still raised the last Passover cup for his disciples. After Judas left, Jesus spoke something that he wouldn't get to hear. Out of the scripture of Exodus, once again, Jesus said, Then I will take you as my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. As the Passover meal came to a close, Jesus and the disciples all sang the traditional psalm, 115 through 118. After this, they headed out of the house and they were going to the Mount of Olives where he usually went with his disciples in the evenings, just as they were accustomed. While they had been staying in Jerusalem, Jesus made a habit of going to this one garden called Gethsemane. As they were on their way, Jesus spoke up again and warned them that all of them would fail and fall away because of him. 
they would all flee. But he would meet them again in Galilee when he was raised up. Peter reacted to this. He says, even if all are made to stumble, I won't. But Jesus warns them, assuredly I say to you, today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times, Peter. It would have been, according to the law of Moses in Exodus and Leviticus, at this time during the night of Passover, that a lamb was already slain and eaten in the same night of Nisan the 14th, the first month. But it's believed by some, some scholars that there was a tradition among the people around this Passover that formed over time. That two things were going on within the span of these two days. Each family, according to how Moses commanded it, would eat the Passover lamb and the meal the night they cooked it inside their house with their family. Just had Jesus had done this night. But something else would happen the next day. For during the time of the kings, the people of Israel fell away and stopped obeying the Lord. So the kings required the people to bring their Passover lamb to the temple and to slay them by the thousands to make sure that the people actually observe the Passover. And it is believed that at this time in history, many of the Jewish people returned back in their own houses to observing a personal Passover lamb with each other. But the chief priests and the leaders of the temple would take their own lamb the next day and they would sacrifice it in the temple, killing it as an atonement, the Passover lamb that delivered the people from Egypt. This reminisced the night when death passed over Israel because of the blood of the lamb. The firstborn of all the Jewish people was spared. Jesus and his disciples went into Gethsemane across the Kidron. Used to going into the wilderness, praying alone, Jesus now walked into a garden to speak with God. Here, in a garden, he would undergo a greater temptation at the end of his ministry than when he first wandered in the wilderness at the beginning. For the greatest stumble of mankind and God's people wasn't in the wilderness but was in a garden. Here in this moment, Jesus would not be the lamb for a nation, but a lamb for a household, a family, the first family that ever disobeyed God. The betrayal. Jesus knew, but none of the disciples knew. He knew that not far from there, a squad of temple guards was being dispatched with an unfaithful friend as its lead. But even now, Jesus could leave here in Gethsemane, which means that this is a place where olive oil was pressed. That's the meaning of the name, Gethsemane. Jesus could have fled toward the Jordan River, toward the valley there, and the area of Jericho and the Dead Sea, according to scholars, he could have walked away less than an hour and disappeared from Caiaphas and Pilate's grasp. Jesus likely could hear the whispers and the voices, the demons prodding him to run away. He could feel the weight of the world's sins laid on his shoulders in his spirit so that the yoke of others would become easy and their burden would become light. As they entered the garden, he looked at the disciples and told them, stay put. And he wanted to pray with them near but at a distance. He took Peter, James, and John, his usual crazy encounters crew, and he wanted them to go a bit further with him. And they noticed that Jesus began to breathe heavier as though he was nervous and feeling overwhelmed with sadness as though depression was trying to crush him my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death stay here and watch with me he said to them as if to say please don't leave me I just need a little bit of I need a friend right now 
He went as far as a stone throw away from him. And he knelt down on his knees. And he was face down to the ground. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me if you can. But nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And then an angel appeared to Jesus and encouraged him in that moment. And he began to pray even more intensely until sweat of blood began to run down his forehead. And it fell to the ground. Jesus rose up from his prayers and he went to Peter and James and John. And they were sleeping. What? Could you not watch one hour with me? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing indeed, but the flesh is weak. And he went back to pray. He knelt down once again and he came on his face. My father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And when he got back up, they were all sleeping again. And they couldn't keep themselves from falling asleep. And Jesus left them again to pray for God to let this pass from him. Thousands of years before this, in a garden before God, a snake once tempted a woman to doubt God. A man and his wife betrayed their creator and chose to trust the serpent's voice over his. But here, Jesus is being asked, not by the serpent to eat of the fruit, but by God to drink of a cup. Jesus' spirit was overwhelmed by agony. The sins of the world falling on him in that moment. He was prepared like the goat on the day of atonement, like the lamb on the day of Passover. All the sins were being imparted to him as God the Father laid His hands on the head of Jesus as He knelt down. Jesus could feel it. The greed, the sexual impurity, the hatred, the racism, the adultery, the theft, the murder. All the sins of the world laid on Him, the Lamb of God. And on the day that Adam and Eve ate of the tree, they died spiritually. But just as the family died in the garden, Jesus, this evening, the Passover lamb of God, takes on spiritual death. Just as he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. He was fully submitted now to God the Father's will. And he could hear. Something in the distance, the sound of marching coming in his direction. No one else could hear it. And as he approached the disciples from his prayer place, he said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's be going. My betrayer is at hand. At that very moment, just as Jesus finished his statement, a large group emerged from the darkness with swords and clubs right on top of them so that they couldn't go anywhere, with Judas leading them in. Whom are you seeking? Jesus asked. Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. As Jesus said this, The power of God knocked them down onto the ground. But Judas, even with this, walks up to them. And he says, Rabbi, Rabbi. Judas has planned earlier with the guards that to confirm Jesus' identity in the midst of the dark garden, he would walk up to him and give him a kiss and stand by him. Right as Judas leans forward to give Jesus the kiss on the cheek, Jesus says, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Judas kissed him anyway and stood with him there so that no one would mistake who ought to be arrested. 
Jesus repeated himself, whom are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, I've told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Then a commotion broke out. They reached out to begin to grab Jesus and arrest him. And some of the disciples were saying, Lord, shall we strike them with a sword? Peter in that moment unsheathed his sword and he strikes off one of the men's ears. He cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus. Jesus says, let it happen. Let this happen. Jesus reaches down and picks up the ear of Malchus. And then to everyone's shock, he puts it back on his head and it's healed to the man. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? All who take up the sword will perish by the sword. If I wanted to, I could pray to the Father and he would send 12 legions of angels. All the strength in that moment left the disciples. They ran away. Those who loved him and were with him this whole time in his ministry ran off and left him alone. They said they would never leave him. But at that moment, they fell to temptation just like Adam and Eve did to betray God. They said that they would drink from the cup that he drank from. But now in this moment, the Messiah was alone in the hands of soldiers, bound, carried off, and prepared for a trial already set to incriminate him. The Lamb of God was bound hand and foot, ready to be offered up. And not soon afterwards, Jesus would be carried into a trial with only his enemies surrounding him. False witnesses and accusations hurled at him, beard ripped, beaten in the face. And the high priest and all the leaders of Jerusalem would finally get what they had been so longing for. Jesus of Nazareth in their hands.